Thank you for joining us and for those who are tuning in on Facebook Live for this Q&A and discussion with author Kelly Lloyd Gilbert. Brought to you by the Iowa Reading Research Center. I'm Sean Thompson. I'm the Communications Specialist for the Iowa Reading Research Center. I'm joined today by Dr. Deborah Reed. Hi, Deborah. Hi, Sean. Hi, everybody. Thanks for joining us today. Deborah is an Associate Professor at the University of Iowa College of Education. She's also the Director of the Iowa Reading Research Center. Dr. Reed has been the director of the IRRC since 2015 and is a national leader in research of methods for improving literacy instruction and assessment, particularly for vulnerable populations. She is also a former English language arts and reading teacher. We are also joined today by Joanne Morenz. Hi, Joanne. Hello there, how are you, Sean? And I am also excited to question Kelly about the book. <laughs> Great, thank you for joining us. Joanne is an English teacher at Exira EHK High School in Elkhorn, Iowa. She has taught since 1991 and is a former um, school principal as well. And she has taught students the novel Conviction by Kelly Lloyd Gilbert. Conviction is also the novel that we read during the Iowa Reading Research Center book study for teens. After the closure of schools in response to the spread of COVID-19, Dr. Reed designed the book study to provide a literacy learning opportunity for teens and to assist families in their efforts to continue literacy learning at home. So each day for the last 24 days, ending yesterday, we have had daily assignments uh, that involve teen participants reading a chapter or two of the book and submitting via the web a written response to a reflection question about the chapter that they just read. And all of this brings us to our special guest. Kelly Lloyd Gilbert is the author of Conviction, a 2016 William Morris Award finalist. She also wrote the novel Picture Us in the Light, which was a Stonewall Honor Book, the winner of the California Book Award, and an LA Times Book Prize finalist. And she is the author of the novel When We Were Infinite, which will be released in October. She is a lifelong Californian who attended nearly 20 years of uh, California public schools and currently lives in the San Francisco Bay Area with her family. Kelly, welcome and thank you for being here. Thanks so much for having me. Very excited to have you. So if any of our attendees on Zoom would like to ask Kelly a question, please submit your question via the Q&A feature on the screen. Then I'll be able to activate, you know, I'll check in with you first, but I'll activate your microphone so you can speak with Kelly directly. Or if you'd rather that I ask your question on your behalf, that's totally fine too. Just let me know when you submit your question that you want me to ask it instead. Also, if you are uh, tuning in on Facebook Live and would like to ask a question, Please post a comment and I'll make sure to get that question asked for you. So we're going to start things off with some questions here from us. Um, Deborah, I believe you have our first question. Great. Thanks again, Kelly, for joining us and for offering this opportunity for all of the students who have participated in this book study. Um, I've had the pleasure of reading their responses and you can tell that they have really been engaged with the book. So, it's been a great experience for them. Um, I was wondering, uh, you incorporated several controversial topics within this novel. And so um, I was wondering how you plan to navigate that with teen readers who may not always share the same perspective. Mm -hmm. um, one thing that I really like about writing for young people is I think that um, there's kind of a, an open-mindedness. Um, I think part of the work of being a teenager and being at that stage in your life is you're kind of figuring out the things that maybe you've been taught that you maybe you have a different opinion on, maybe you still believe them and you feel really strongly about them. You want to sort of figure out how to apply them to the world around you and sort of weigh them against the things you're seeing. Um, and I feel that teenagers are kind of uniquely great at sort of approaching maybe more controversial issues because they don't necessarily have the same baggage that adults do with them. Um, I think they're often really passionate and engaged in various issues and I think they have really interesting perspectives. Um, and I've found that in general, teenagers are less kind of squeamish about 
maybe controversy um, in a lot of senses. I think they're really willing to engage. They're willing to sort of hear various sides and they're willing to really take a hard look at questions and to question those things. I think part of being that age is questioning a lot of things. Um, and so I think you see that theme in a lot of books aimed at young people is um, that idea of something you've been told maybe by your parents or by whoever um, and trying to figure out is that something you're going to make yours or something you're going to change as you move into the world as you're growing up. Thank you. Uh, that's, I find that response really fascinating, especially looking at the uh, reflections that students have submitted. Um, huh. I think that's a really uh, apt uh, a response. Uh, Joanne's next with another question. Hi, Kelly. I also uh, liked your whole idea about teenagers and openness and applying their opinions. And my question kind of feeds right off that. You geared conviction to young adults mm -hmm. and you talked about that open-mindedness, their ideas, their opinions. Is there a particular impact with this book, with some of those controversial issues that you really wanted to make on the audience? Um, that's such a good question. I think um, I would, one of the things I sort of cared a lot about that I, as I was writing it is um, when I was in high school, I know that I had a lot of friends who were being um, really mistreated at home. Sometimes I think it crossed the line into abuse. Sometimes I think maybe it wouldn't clinically fit that definition, but it was still just kind of a really horrible way to grow up. And I really remember the feeling as a young person of knowing this was happening and believing my friends that this was happening, but also knowing that probably adults wouldn't care or if we brought it up, it's just not, you know, maybe they were friends with the parents and they didn't want to make a scene or they felt that it, was the parents right or whatever. Um, and I remember feeling just sort of a helplessness around that issue, um, watching things happening to people I cared about. And um, I feel like part of being that age for me was the sense that like my opinion wasn't weighted as much as an adult's opinion. And so one of the things I would hope, I guess, that the book would um, speak to young people maybe in similar circumstances is that you know, maybe you don't have as much power or agency in the situation, but what you're feeling and thinking is really important. It does matter. It is valid. Um, I think that would be one of the things that I would hope most to sort of speak to young readers through the story. Great. Thanks, Kelly. Um, what are some of the aspects that you enjoy about writing young adult fiction? Are there any yeah. as aspects to young adult fiction that you find to be a challenge as the writer? I think um, one of the things I really enjoy is getting to talk to students. I do a lot of school visits and I really always love that. Um, I think that if you look at sort of the trends happening in young adult literature, um, I feel like it's kind of ahead of the curve on a lot of things. A lot of the questions that are coming up um, that young people are dealing with um, that we've been writing about, I think, tend to happen in some ways even sooner than other industries in publishing. And I think that's a reflection of how much young people are looking ahead to their futures. They're looking at their presence. And I think they feel a lot of what's happening in the world in a really magnified way, because when you're that age, you know, you're not voting, you're sort of having this really regimented life because adults are making decisions for you. And so I think you're sort of disproportionately feeling the impact of a lot of those things. Um, and so I think young adult literature is a space where you know, stories can grapple with what it feels like to be um, marginalized, to be powerless, to feel like you want to change the future for yourself. Um, and so I think that's one aspect I really like about it. Um, and what was, sorry, what was the other part of the question? What were- Are there any challenges? Just, about oh, challenges. That? Yeah. Um, one thing that's kind of hard for me is as a writer, I, um, I always want to be sort of more internal and a lot of young adult literature is about ha having more things happen sort of off the character's head and like onto the page. Um, so that's always like on a craft issue, something I always have to work on. Um, and I think also um, for characters that I sort of think about, sometimes I think about them into the future, how their perspective would change, but usually for young adult stories, you want the stories to take place in sort of a really defined period of their lives. Um, so trying to communicate um, things, I guess, that would be outside the perspectives that they have that they could reach for, but still getting them into the story somehow, that's always something that um, I spend a lot of time working on. 
Great. We do have a question from an attendee. So <clears throat> Madeline, I'm going to activate your microphone if you'd like to ask your question directly to Kelly. Hi, Madeline. Hi. Um, my question is, how did you come up with the characters and their background stories? Oh, great question. Um, so it's actually interesting. I, I came up with the characters first in a totally different story. Um, Brayden was the same and his dad was the same. And then there was like a whole storyline around Alex that was totally different. Um, and so the characters were like named the same thing, but they had like a totally different arc, a totally different path, and they were different people. Um, and I think as I was kind of developing the story, um, it's always kind of like a catch-22. It's like you don't quite know who the characters are until you know what they're doing, how they're reacting to the plot, but then you don't really know the plot until you know who the people are and how they're like driving it. Um, so for me, it was just like a ton of revisions and writing it over and writing it over and picking out the parts of the characters that I felt like I really connected with or that I could manage to write for like the however many months or years it was going to take me to write the story that wouldn't bore me. Um, and then for Trey, who's one of my favorite characters, in the first drafts, he was um, this really like kind, angelic, like really like upstanding sort of citizen person, great guy. And I think there just wasn't a lot of tension in that. And um, I was kind of interested in the idea of what would happen if actually he was someone who um, didn't like himself, was kind of not happy with where he'd ended up or how things were going. And that was kind of more interesting for me to dive into. Um, and so I think just kind of continually asking myself these questions about the characters, like, would it be interesting if this, or like, how would they respond if this, and then kind of revising and revising and going deeper and deeper into their stories. Great. I'm going to add that Madeline has been one of our loyal followers of our book study and has submitted some absolutely fantastic responses that we've shared back on our Facebook page too. So oh, I'll I'm have so to check those out. Yeah, I'm, I'm so glad you could join us today, Madeline. Thank you. I'm going to put you back on mute, Madeline, but if you have any other questions, feel free to submit them. Um, another question about characters. We have a few of those um, to ask here. So perfect timing. Um, the first sentence of your Twitter bio is inventor of pretend people, which I really like. <laughs> Sounds like a fun thing to do. So mm -hmm. how do you go about doing that? Like how do you develop your characters for your books? Um, one question I get a lot is whether I base them on people I know. Um, and the answer is always no. I find the idea of somebody I know reading a story I wrote and like thinking it's about them just like totally mortifying. Um, so I tend to write characters that are really different from people I know or to just not base them at all. Um, I think for me, I usually have sort of a general idea of a person. Maybe it's a specific moment from their past or maybe some quality about them or maybe I can envision one scene um, that I think would be fun to write and then it's a matter of sort of getting there. Um, one thing I like to do um, that I think is a really helpful writing exercise if any of the people watching are um, authors as well or writers as well um, is I like to think about seeing a scene or something happen through the character's really specific lens um, and try to imagine something kind of neutral like maybe um, a child falls on the street and doesn't get back up again or um, something happened like how they would view that like what would be the specific things that they would be bringing to watching this that would change how they're viewing it, what would be sort of the trigger moments in their past that they would think about, what would their response be, would they want to help, would they keep walking. Um, so taking these kind of small discrete moments and imagining how they would impact one particular character. Sometimes I'll do that with two characters, so it'll be like one scene and they both have sort of their different reactions to the same thing happening. Um, or I do a lot of like flashbacks um, and usually what happens is I'll write like I don't know, probably 600 pages worth of material for each character. And then most of it is either it evolves into something else or it was just never really great to begin with. And so I end up trashing it. Um, but I find that having to sort of really put out a lot and then sort of pick out what rises to the top as being sort of powerful enough to move on with. Go ahead, Deborah. Yeah. Um, 
I just can't imagine 600 pages of uh, text on each character is really a fascinating approach to thinking about kind of overwriting for it and then having it rise to the top. You hit it a little bit earlier about some of your favorite characters, but I was wondering if you had one favorite character from Conviction and what inspired you to create that particular character? I think probably Trey was my favorite character. Um, I think on sort of a personal writing level, um, the writing I'd been doing before that was, um, I feel like one of the things that a lot of characters of mine did was they would sort of say what they thought and whatever they wanted, they would sort of do it. Um, and I think it was a lot more interesting to write someone like Trey where he doesn't do the things that he wants to do. Um, and he sort of is trapped in wanting to be someone he isn't or he wanting to do things that he can't quite bring himself to do. Um, and I think he was fun to work with in that sense and sort of trying to write this character where he was often not very vocal about what he was feeling and sort of using an, a, like Brayden as a narrator to sort of figure out what was going on with him when it wasn't something he was like forthright about. Talking about, oh, sorry, go ahead, Deborah. Oh, I was just going to say thank you, it's Joanne's turn. <laughs> <laughs> oh, talking about Brayden right there at the end, and you mentioned that Trey's your favorite character, but yet you chose to tell the story through Brayden's eyes. Um, how do you think if you had chosen an omniscient third person narrator or maybe a minor character to tell the story through their eyes, um, what would happen? What would change or why did you choose the way you did? That's such an interesting question. Um, I think part of the reason, uh, one thing that would really change is I think with Graydon as a first person narrator um, and the story is told so closely like inside his head and through his perspective. Um, and I think when you grow up a certain way um, for most of your life as a young person, I think you think that's normal. You don't really see as much of other lives happening around you to know like, oh, hey, this is actually really messed up or like this is, you know, not something that most people experience. Um, and so for him, I think also he was like emotionally invested in the idea of his father being a good person and being a good father. Um, and so that was kind of like a fiction he had to tell himself in order to like survive emotionally with his life. Um, and so I think in a third person omniscient narrator that would have, that myth kind of would have been dispelled with much more quickly, probably much more immediately. Um, and so I think the question of, you know, what is the morally right thing to do in this situation, um, like for Brayden, um, I think maybe would have been a lot more clear cut. Um, whereas for Brayden, it feels like sort of this moral dilemma um, and kind of a morally gray thing, whereas to, an outside observer, I think maybe it would have been a lot more clear cut, like, oh, you should tell the truth, you should turn your father in. Um, so I think that would have been a big, probably the biggest change. I'm gonna throw things out of order because of that. <laughs> <laughs> if I can, cause I'm gonna go to, to my other question, cause she just kind of mentioned that. Um, and this is kind of a spoiler alert question for you. Um, as a reader, I was disappointed Pointed with Braden's choice in the courtroom, if I dare say. Um, did you consider the opposite action for him in the courtroom? I did actually. So usually, almost always when I write something, I kind of know the ending before I'm like very far into it. I kind of know where things are headed towards. Um, but for this one, sort of up until like the end as I was writing the draft, I really wasn't sure what he would do. Um, I was kind of really angsting over it. I was kind of going both ways. Um, but I think I felt like ultimately, um, as someone who sort of grew up the way he did, um, I, I remember reading once, which I thought was really apt that um, for so much of your life, like your parents are like, the, they become your internal narrative. They become like the voice inside your head. Um, and I think especially so in Brayden's case, having like a single parent and someone who played such like an outsized role in his life. Um, and I feel like for people who are in a situation where their parent is abusive or somebody else they know is abusive, um, it can be like a lifetime of work of learning to sort of retool that internal narrative and learning to um, 
you know, see the world in a way that's not through the lens of this person who was so powerful in your life. Um, and so I felt like even if I felt like the right thing for him to do wasn't the choice that he made, um, when I was trying to picture what he would do, I guess I felt like um, being able to break free in that sense and being able to sort of unlearn his whole life and being able to make this choice that would, you know, very possibly result in his dad dying. Um, I felt like he wouldn't do that necessarily. I think um, being able to sort of break free from that and start new patterns, like I feel like it takes so much time for most people. And I, I would hope in the future, I guess he would feel differently and sort of come to a different understanding of himself and his dad and the world. Um, but I felt like it wouldn't happen yet. Like I think a lot of the work would still be ahead of him. Thank you. So I messed that up. So I think it's actually to you, Sean. It's me. Skip <laughs> me when we get around there. Okay. Sounds great. Uh, just a little bit more about writing from the perspective of the character that you chose. So you wrote from the perspective of a male teenager in this book. Um, what is it like for you to write from a perspective like that that's different from your own current perspective and how do you put yourself in someone else's shoes like that? Um, so one thing I had always found when I was in like workshop, fiction workshops or whatever, um, when I was writing a female narrator, everyone assumed it was about me, um, <laughs> which really sort of bothered me. Um, I think it felt really vulnerable in a way it shouldn't have because I wasn't writing about myself. Um, so I think for a while I was like, I'm going to write about characters super different from me. So no one's like, oh, did your dad go to prison for running over a police officer? Um, <laughs> And so I think um, as, you know, someone who grew up going to school and reading the literary canon, I think probably 90% of what I read growing up was by men and about men and male characters. And so I think women are often sort of trained to think um, about the way men would think about a story or read stories about men. Um, so it didn't feel like as much of a stretch for me, I think, um, for better or worse. And I think, um, Usually, once I feel like I have the character's voice and sort of the lens they're viewing um, the world through, then it's really enjoyable for me to sort of dive in and sort of go deeper into that and figure out their story um, as, um, yeah, sort of with that voice and with that lens. Great. Uh, I find it fascinating to be able to get into the head of a teenage boy. Um, and all of us as teachers um, and parents wish we could get in the heads of a teenage boy and understand what's going on. Um, but you did it masterfully in your novel. So um, I, I also have kind of a spoiler question. Uh, so anyone who's listening that hasn't finished the book, you may want to mute for a moment here. Um, you mentioned just a moment ago that you kind of know from the start of writing where the story is going and how it's going to end up, but was there ever a time that you considered uh, finding Martin guilty? And what persuaded you to have him found innocent? I did think about that. Um, it, was, it was something I wasn't sure about for a long time, but I think ultimately just um, thinking about, since the story for me was so rooted in Brayden's character, like what he would ultimately do. Um, and I felt like he just wouldn't make that choice. I think putting any child in that situation would be so horrible. And I feel like a lot of them probably wouldn't be able to make a choice that would like condemn their parent to um, death potentially. Um, as I was researching, I was learning that there's, um, like spousal privilege in a courtroom, so you you can you know you can't be compelled to testify against your spouse, um, but no protections like that exist for children and parents, um, which was interesting to learn. Um, and but I did I think all along I sort of knew that the ending I was going for was I wanted Brayden to leave, um, I wanted him to sort of get out. Um, so that was kind of the ending that I felt certain about. And then the question of uh, a conviction was something I was less sure as I was writing. I think you, you do a really good job of including mystery as a major element of the plot of conviction. And also from what I've read in your most recent book, Pictures in the Light. So how do you go about unraveling 
the mysteries in your books without giving too much or too little away? Um, so I, as a writer, I think my least favorite thing is plot. <laughs> um, plot and timeline, because it feels like math and I hate math. Um, and so I think a lot of it is working backwards, um, figuring out what somebody would know and when, and then also sort of keeping it, I think, really closely in like a really close first person um, and figuring out both what they would find out, how they would find it out, and also maybe the ways they would rationalize it to themselves. Um, I think a lot of times we do that if something sort of doesn't fit our sort of preconceived narrative about our lives or our history. Um, it's easy to sort of just not think about it that hard or to just like retroactively like sort of recast what we knew so everything is still like the story that we've been telling ourselves. Um, and so I think for mystery type things, that's kind of a balance because you want characters to do that so it's not like this huge revelation happening every like chapter, um, but also there has to be like enough of a nagging feeling that they want to keep sort of digging and seeing what's happening. Um, and then I feel like it usually has to build to some kind of point where they realize that things are in fact so different than what they thought, or there's so many un unanswered questions that they kind of have no choice to like really dig into it and figure it out. Um, so I think for me, when I like reading mystery things, it's usually rooted in the characters and how it's going to affect um, their lives, both materially, what they learn, and also just like their self-perception or just um, how it's going to impact them emotionally. We asked our readers a question about the role of baseball in the story. And we had a couple of responses that drew some really nice analogies between baseball and life. And uh, so I was wondering if you had that in mind when you decided to make baseball pretty central to the story and to what was happening, or if there was some other sort of driver for making baseball part of this. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think um, I was writing it at a time when um, my team that I like was having really exciting things happening. So I think it was like kind of at the forefront of my mind. Um, and I think also when I was thinking about Brayden, um, I feel like I like to write characters who have like a really strong moral code. Um, and maybe that moral code is skewed. Maybe it's kind of a bizarre one, but something that they really adhere to and really follow. Um, and for Brayden, I think that was baseball. I think for someone whose life was so dominated by such a controlling parent, um, baseball seemed like a place where he could sort of exert control over his own world, however temporarily. Um, and I think for teenagers, um, so much of your life is so um, defined for you, you know, no matter what happens between you and another person at school, you know, you still have to sit next to them in Spanish the next day. Um, and so I think there's so much that's out of your control. And so I think um, the way a lot of people respond to that is finding things they can control. Um, and so for Braden, I think baseball was such an important one because he was talented enough that he could really sort of affect the flow of the game and he could also um, live up to the standards he wanted to um, in a way that he couldn't maybe feel like he could in other areas of his life. Thank you. Joanne, I think we're back to you. Well, I think that's interesting because the thing you just talked about, like his moral code and how he just loved baseball and everything leads into my question because loyalty was such a theme, a word, a constant throughout the book. And I know a lot of it, you've touched on this, the loyalty to his dad and the fact that his home situation and his relationship with his dad and how to prove that loyalty but as a coach of teenagers, which I've been in the past, um, loyalty is also an important part of being a teammate. And so I wonder at times, um, one of the scenes, again, a spoiler alert later on, involved Maddie and um, something he wasn't able to do that he had kind of promised her kind of left her, you know, standing there. And even his teammates at times, um, how would the story have changed if he was able to um, be more loyal to her in the one situation mm -hmm. and maybe his teammates in some? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think, um, yeah, I think one of the things that happens with abuse is you have this really skewed view of loyalty. Um, I think it's a lot of people are manipulated into thinking that 
their highest loyalty needs to be to their abuser um, and that they are responsible for protecting them, for keeping them happy, um, for, you know, keeping everything sort of stable. Um, and so I think for Brayden, that was really true. And he wasn't sort of able to see that this was this really manipulative tactic that Mart was using against him that was destroying his life. It was, as you alluded to, it was destroying his other relationships because he wasn't able to sort of, um, you know, have the relationship with Maddie that he wanted to. He wasn't able to sort of make himself vulnerable and like, you know, pursue like a friendship or more. Um, and with his teammates too, um, he, yeah, I think he basically almost always up until the very end sort of put his dad first. Um, and I think that the story would have been super different if he'd been able to do those things. Um, I think it, especially because it would have been a reflection of the fact that he would have been able to sort of see through the manipulation that was happening to him and have a healthier sense of himself. Um, I, feel, I was asked once at a, um, at a book event, what's kind of the one question you feel like all your books are asking or that as a writer, you're just like always pursuing. Um, and I think for me, the question was like, what do we owe other people? What do we owe one another? Um, I think that's the central thing that sort of keeps me writing. And I think for Brayden, um, so much of his life was figuring out that question. Like, what did he owe his father? Um, what would it mean if he was not loyal? Could he live with himself as a result? Um, would his life be better? And I think it would have been, um, but I think it took him sort of a while to get there. That really clears things up for me. It makes me look at the book in a different lens than I had before, just mm -hmm. listening to you say that, which I find very fascinating. I think, Sean, you have a, diff a question for her. I do. I just wanted to also remind anybody uh, watching that if you have a question, feel free to submit a question via Zoom on the Q&A feature or post a comment on Facebook and we'll get your question asked. Um, Kelly, how do you attempt to create a mood for a novel? Do you try and maintain the same mood throughout or do you change it depending on what's going on in the chapter? Um, I think, yeah, it depends on what's going on in the chapter. And I think for me personally, as I'm writing, what I usually do is I'll have like um, a playlist of like, sometimes like two, sometimes like several songs and I'll just play it over and over and over and over. And I think it's sort of, when I start writing, it helps me access kind of the feeling that I'm going for, or just the mood that I hope sort of permeates um, the overall novel, even if like there's sort of up and down rises in different scenes. Um, you mentioned a little bit ago about the conviction um, at the end, um, although he wasn't convicted. Um, we asked our readers about the multiple meanings of the book title conviction and how those meanings apply to the characters and to the events in the, in the story. Uh, was it intentional that uh, you were playing off these multiple meanings of conviction when you chose the title or, or how did that come about? Yeah, um, so for the title, originally it was called something else. It was called um, City on a Hill, which is a reference to um, a Bible verse about how if someone is like living their lives as a follower of Jesus, like they should be like shining like the city on a hill. So people will look and be like, wow, like that's great. Um, and um, my publisher felt like the it was more of like an adult title, adult sounding title than they were going for. Um, so they were like, let's come up with something that's like one word, just like a really punchy word. And it's like some kind of biblical reference, but also more. So like we like come through like all these different like passages from the Bible and like picked out different words that could like try to mean multiple things. Um, it was this, like long process. I hate titles. I hate coming up with titles. Um, and so eventually um, we hit on this one and everyone kind of liked how it could play sort of on multiple levels with, um, yeah, the word conviction. Yeah, I think it was perfect. Um, so that was a good process to get oh, to good. that final. <laughs> <laughs> um, and Joanne, I think. You said earlier, which I really liked, I even wrote it down because I keep writing down notes. Um, I would hope in the future and you were talking about Braden. And my next question goes along with that. And that is, what is the next chapter for Braden? In your mind, how do you see Braden in the future? 
Um, so in the future, so he, he left, he moved to New York, which I think is a really good step for him. I think he definitely needed to get out. Um, I, I think in the end of the book, it, he was talking about how he was never going to go back to baseball. It was too fraught for him. Um, I would hope, I guess, that in the future he could maybe reclaim it um, and have it feel less like it belonged to his father and more like it belonged to him. Um, and I thought a lot about what would happen when his dad contacted him, because of course he would. Um, and I, I would hope for him that eventually he would maybe be able to cut him out of his life. Um, but having sort of witnessed a lot of people I love go through sort of um, a lifetime with sort of toxic family members, um, I feel like it's a really long process. And so I think realistically, probably he would, it would take a long time. Probably he'd still fly out to visit him. He'd probably pick up his calls. Um, but I think he would also have a hard time interacting with him because he would feel really guilty about um, letting him off the hook, I guess. Um, and so I think it would forever be like a really complicated relationship for him. Um, but I hope he would still play baseball, um, maybe go to college or pursue some future that he was excited about. I like that. And Sean, I think you have someone coming in now. Yes, I'm gonna go to Madeline next for a question from the attendee. Go ahead, Madeline. Why did you make Braden's religion so important in his life? Um, that's a good question. I think when I was younger, I was like really involved in like um, my own church and youth group. And I felt like there wasn't a lot of um, stuff that I was reading that um, dealt with faith in kind of a more complicated way. Um, I read a lot of books as a teen that were sort of like very much aimed for like a Christian audience. Um, and they were sort of, they always ended really happily and sort of like reaffirming faith, um, which I think can be really great. But I think I also had questions that I wanted to sort of go into more deeply. Um, and I felt like for Braden, um, for him, his faith was so tied up also with his dad. Um, and I feel like the way he sort of approached it and was given to it from his dad was sort of this really damaging thing for him. Um, and so I was interested in exploring what it would look like for him to live that and was there a way he could sort of come to terms with it maybe on his own in a less fraught way. And how do you want people reading your books to react or to connect emotionally, um, specifically with the characters that they're getting to know as they read? Um. I think in terms of reacting emotionally um, and connecting with the characters, I guess my big hope would be that the characters would feel real enough and well-developed enough that people would react to them at all. Um, <laughs> I think it's, it's always interesting hearing people's reaction to different characters because I think everyone's bringing their own background and their own worldview to and lens to the characters. And so someone maybe reminds them of someone they hated, so they hate the character or um, whatever. But I guess I would hope that they would feel like they understood the characters um, a little bit better and they made them sort of think a little bit about maybe what they were going through or who they were. Um, that would be my big hope, I guess. Somewhat related to that, is there an overall message or takeaway that you're hoping teen readers will uh, glean from your book? Um, I think the idea that your choices can be really powerful um, and that um, I think what what you're going through, whatever it might be, is really real and really valid. And even if sort of no one on the outside sees it or feels the same way about it that you do, um, or maybe a lot of adults in your life are telling you that you shouldn't be feeling the way you feel about it, um, that, you know, maybe you're right. Maybe what you're feeling is real, is true. Um, and um, especially, I think, for people who are in situations where they're not safe at home or they're dealing with, um, you know, someone who's trying to control what they're thinking or feeling, um, that it can get better and you can get out of it. And um, yeah, you deserve better than that. 
It's a great message for teens. Uh, Joanne and I uh, first worked with this novel while Joanne was teaching at a juvenile justice facility. So um, that was an interesting experience. I would have loved to have been able to um, share your thoughts on that with her class. Mm. So thanks for that. Um, and Joanne, back to you. Well, just kind of piggybacking off what you said at all the places where I've had the opportunity to teach, I think I'm probably most excited by your statement about themes and different ideas, how you, how you said first, you know, yeah, your, your choices make a big difference. And so when I was sitting there as a teacher reading the book or thinking about the theme, you know, make your choice, choose from right from wrong, know what's best, know what's right, know what's wrong. But you brought up a whole different segment or theme that lots of kids can relate to that I might possibly not be able to relate to about, you know, the impact of being in a toxic environment. And so I appreciate, because I want students to know that teachers don't always have the only theme of a book, the only underlying meaning that you have to be able to reach out and share and discuss and say, well, you know, I thought about it from a different angle, or this is the theme that matters to me. And I think that's so important that you share that, which you just did, which I learned as, as, Dr. Reed and Sean and I are sitting here. We are all still learning, even as we're reading and as a seasoned person that, that I am, reading new books and learning from people. And so just like you had multiple themes there, it kind of leads into the next question. What advice would you give to not just teen readers, like I said about realizing there's so many different pieces, but what about to those teens who want to be novelists? Mm -hmm. Um, first of all, it's really exciting. Um, and I think a lot of times, a lot of the advice is, you know, make sure you're reading, make sure you're writing every day. Um, I think people all have different paths. Um, but I think for me, the most important thing for, um, young writers is, um, that you're going to hear a lot of voices when you start sharing your writing with people. Um, and I think a lot of people will be like, oh, you should turn your story into this, or you should turn your story into this, or what if you did this? Um, and I think it can be really great to solicit feedback, um, but I think one of the most important things also is to know that not everyone is your audience, um, and that whatever story you want to tell, um, you want to find people who can help you sort of reflect the story that is coming out on the page, and so then you can figure out on your own like what you wanna do with it to make it the story you wanna tell. Um, I think it can be really challenging when you're first starting to write and sharing it with people um, to be hearing so much feedback and to feel like you have to sort of go with all of it. Um, but I think that uh, you shouldn't, and you should sort of figure out on your own what story you want to tell and learn how to take the feedback and figure out is it going to ultimately help you get it to the place you want? And if so, great, then that can be really helpful. And if not, um, it's okay to let it go and to find the people who are the right readers for you. Got about 13 minutes left. So if, again, if anybody watching has any questions, feel free to submit your questions via the Q&A feature on Zoom or comment on Facebook. Um, you said that coming up with a plot can be difficult for you, Kelly, um, but that creating characters is one of your favorite parts of writing novels. And then the characters in turn can help develop the plot for you as you create the characters, which is a really great way to use a strength to overcome something that you don't like as much about the writing process. So what advice would you give to other writers in terms of using their individual strengths to work through and overcome some of the things they might perceive to be um, their weaker writing skills? I think, um... One advice, um, one piece of advice that I got from one of my favorite teachers that I still use a lot today is um, the idea that you don't need to focus as much on the things that aren't working um, because you can sort of build enough momentum with the things that are. Um, so when I'm reading for somebody else, what I like to do is if, you know, I'm reading a chapter where a lot of it sort of doesn't make sense or it isn't really connecting emotionally or whatever, um, I think finding the parts that are and sort of digging deeper into those is sort of going to be most effective because eventually the things that aren't working are going to fall away as you sort of you know go deeper into the parts that have a lot of heat and movement and power um 
And so I think it's kind of the same thing as you're writing. Um, you know, if you really hate outlining, you know, don't outline, just like write the scenes that you like. Um, and I think when you're sort of engaged and connected and you're enjoying yourself, I think that tends to be much more effective than trying to slog through the things that feel like a chore um, because then you won't want to. I'm sure it takes a lot of practice as a writer to develop that skill. And a moment ago, you mentioned in your advice to uh, teens who are interested in becoming writers that they should read a lot and they should write a lot, uh, which is music to Joanne's in my ears <laughs> to have you saying that. Um, but can you tell us a few things about the favorite books that you had as a teen or as some of the great um, books even recently that you've read, what would your recommendations be? Um, one of the books I read recently that I really loved was called um, The Echo Room. It's by Parker Peavy House. And it was super interesting to me because it was like so different from anything I would ever write and also usually read. Um, it's like a time loop story. And so it, it starts with these teens who are they discover that they're both trapped in this bunker um, and they sort of have to figure out how they got there, how they can get out, if they can get out. And as I was reading it, I was like so confused and like, I was just like, what is happening? But then it was also so skillfully done that I was like so invested. Um, and I felt like it dealt really interestingly with like themes of like um, kind of a lot of what we're going through now, actually there was, um, in the story there was like sort of a big pandemic and sort of like questions about like the worth of human life versus like technology and the economy and stuff and so it was really interesting i would recommend that um another book i read recently that i really loved was called the patron saints of nothing by randy rubai um which is about a teenager who he lives in the states um his dad is from the philippines and he got word that his cousin had been killed um as part of the drug war in the philippines um and so he travels back to try to figure out what happened to his cousin. Um, that was a really great book. And I've also been really enjoying lately, um, it's not out yet, but it's a book about the Titanic by Stacey Lee. Um, and she also wrote a really amazing book um, last year, I think it came out called The Downstairs Girl, which is historical fiction about um, a Chinese American girl living in Atlanta in the 1850s um, and she's, secretly writing this like advice column from this like sort of downstairs hiding place where she lives. Um, it was really a great book. So those are some things I've read lately that I really enjoyed and would recommend. Great tips. Thank you. So you mentioned how the Echo Room kind of had things about the pandemic. Mm -hmm. And that leads me to my next question. And that is how has the COVID-19 pandemic affected you, since it's affected other people day to day, has it changed your life as a writer? Um, what have you had to do to adapt and to try to implement things and to adjust? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's definitely been challenging on sort of a time level. Um, I have three small kids. They're six, three, and nine months. Um, and so now they're home all the time, of course. Um, and so carving out time to sort of get things done has been more challenging. Um, and I think sort of one of the most challenging things for all the writers I'm talking to is um, when you publish a book, usually it's completely finished about a year before it actually hits shelves, um, which means you're starting writing it at least a year before that. And so um, trying to imagine what the world is going to look like when our next stories come out is really challenging. Um, so, you know, we don't know also how much to change our stories, like are we you know, writing into a future where like there's still no vaccine and this is still happening or, you know, um, so I think sort of trying to, yeah, envision how much, and I think also like writing about something as it's happening, you know, we don't know where things are going to end. Um, so I think that's been a really big challenge in terms of writing is just knowing how to speak to what's happening um, and what the future is going to look like um, and how to address that in fiction, I guess. That that's fascinating. I didn't even think about the fact that when you're working a year ahead of things, mm -hmm. that, that we have no idea what yeah. tomorrow's going to no look like. No one knows, right? So, yeah. yeah. Oh, that's fascinating. Thank you. Sean. 
Kelly, Kelly, what can you tell us about your new book that you have coming out in the fall? Um, so I actually got word this morning that it's actually probably going to be come out, coming out in the spring um, for pandemic related reasons. Um, but it's about um, uh, a girl who's a violinist and she, um, the way that baseball sort of plays this huge role in Braden's life, um, violin plays a huge role in Beth's life. Um, and it's a story that actually I started writing um, almost 13 or 14 years ago. Um, and it's kind of been this like book of my heart that I've been writing for over a decade. Um, in the first draft, the characters were like using landlines and like no one had a cell phone. Um, and I sort of tried a couple different times to publish it and the timing never quite worked out. And it's finally come out in the spring. So I'm really excited because it's been something that's been with me for most of my, not most of my life, but like a third of my life. That sounds really great. And again, the title is? The title is When We Were Infinite. Great. Everybody keep an eye out for that. Let's see what Kelly has for us next. And since it's Friday, I thought we could end with a few quick, fun, rapid fire questions for you. Great. So what do you use to write? When My you laptop. write, do you use a laptop? Mm -hmm. Okay. And where do you write? I write usually like hunched horribly sitting on my bed, like killing my back over my laptop. <laughs> <laughs> are, you, are you friends with any other novelists? And if so, who? I am. Um, too many to list, but um, we've been really lucky. I live in the Bay Area and there's a community of probably 20 or 30 um, YA novelists. Um, the books I recommended are all friends of mine. Um, yeah, the YA community is pretty close knit. So there's a pretty good chance that if you read a book, then you read the next book, the authors probably know each other. <laughs> book title preference, short like conviction or longer like pictures in the light? Usually like longer, but I hate coming up with titles. <laughs> <laughs> you live in the Bay Area in California, San Francisco Giants or Oakland A's? Definitely the Giants, but it's hard not to also love the A's. <laughs> Which fellow author would you like to meet most? Oh, um, probably Curtis Sittenfeld. Um, she wrote a book called Prep and then a book called American Wife, um, among others. Favorite reading spot? Um, the beach. Good one. You can only name three things that young aspiring scribes should do to continue to improve as writers. What are they? Read things you like. Um, get enough sleep so that you have energy to do things and find some kind of community that you can share writing with. Great. So we're wrapping up here. Is there anything else that you'd like to, uh, to add? Um, well, thank you so much for having me. And um, to any of the teenagers who are watching this, I just want to say that I know what you're going through right now is really tough. Um, it's kind of unprecedented. Um, people probably tell you you're living through history, which probably isn't that comforting. Um, and I hope that you are doing well. And if you're feeling anger or grief about the things that you're missing, that's super valid. Um, if school is not a safe place for you and you're happy to be home, that's super valid too. Um, but I hope that things get better for all of us soon and for you and just hang in there. Great. So I'm sure on behalf of Joan and Deborah, thank you so much for joining us. This has been a great conversation about conviction and about your practice as a writer. And um, we really appreciate you joining us. Anything else, Joanne or Deborah? Looks like they are good. Well, thank you so much for having me. Thank you so much. Have a great weekend. And um, we will look forward to seeing your book when it comes out. Thanks. Take care. Thank you. Thanks, Madeline, for joining us. Thank you, Madeline. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Bye. Bye.